Hi Instagram, this is Emma Donoghue. I'm here for a chat with Rachel Joyce. She's going to be in Stroud, Gloucestershire, UK, and I'm going to be in London, Ontario. And we have somebody joining us already. Hello, Jane Sanderson, writer, and many others. Oh, look, I'm going to electronically wave to you. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm, you, I'm, I'm coming to you f on Instagram directly from my bed because <laughs> It's one of those days, you know, the son's upstairs on a Minecraft server, the daughter's doing an online Broadway bootcamp dance class, the partner is on a serious university Zoom meeting, so I'm in my bedroom trying not to annoy the cat who was sitting on the spot just before me. Um, I think any minute now we're going to see a request from Rachel to join. Huh, I'm new to this, frankly. I've never had sort of authority over an online event. So, um... Anyway, I'll flash the cover of my book first. This is the beautiful The Pull of the Stars. I recently did a little um, uh, Twitter poll, my first again. All us writers are having to learn new skills these days. Yeah, Twitter poll about the book covers. Um, the American book cover features a very austere, beautiful um, watch because um, like all nurses, my protagonist, Julia Power in 1918, has a dangling watch on her, which she has to consult regularly. Um, and then the UK cover features these beautiful birds because um, there's a, a veteran soldier in the novel who has a, a magpie as a pet. Um, and um, yeah, anyway, the, the birds got um, the most, uh, the most um, votes. Okay, I'm just looking for Rachel now. Let's see. I was telling my partner that this is a, a bit of a nightmare for a writer because if I fail to let Rachel into the event, I'm just going to have to talk fervently about her book for the next hour. Mind you, I can do that because I read it very recently, so I'm full of things to say about it. Um, Rachel Joyce, wonderful. <laughs> Go live, Rachel Joyce. Um, it's so nice to see so many of you, you joining us already. This is wonderful. Hi, Rachel. Hello, we did it. I love your background. I want oh. red now. <laughs> You know, no matter what we do now, we have achieved the basic technical stuff, you know. <laughs> they can't complain about us. Here we are simultaneously. Nope. I look a little yeah. overlit like I'm in a very um, low budget production. I think my, um, you know what, I have a ring light, which I share with the 13 year old. I'm going to try. Ooh, that's even brighter. Oh. There should be a soft and mellow setting. Anyway, <laughs> I'm a little overlit. You look much more naturalistic. Well, that's very kind of you. I think I've just <laughs> lit the back. That's what I managed to do. I see. Um, do you have the cover? But it's crazy we have to think about these things now, isn't it? I've got so many actor friends who self-tape, and I've always felt so sorry for them. Uh, I never thought that we would be trying to do the same thing. Well, you've seen this from both sides, haven't you, Rachel? Weren't you an actor? I was. Many, many years ago, I was. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so and you've I, looked I at life from both sides. <laughs> yes, but I stopped. <laughs> And um, like myself, you write plays as well. So we both, I'm sure, are in mourning for, um, for theatre. Though, of course, radio drama is surviving the pandemic a lot better than most forms of drama. It is. It is. I was thinking about the, uh, the other day, I was thinking, actually, what you need to do now, though, is get lots of kind of small chamber pieces with just two people out there, don't you? That's the thing to do. Is, yeah. I mean, yeah. Or monologues. So, That's the way forward. And of course, in Ireland, we have a long tradition of writing plays in which one person at a time, you know, pontificates to the audience. So I'm hoping we'll have a revival of, you know, that kind of, that yes, kind of play. Yes, Forget all this intense physicality and dance-based experimental performance. Bring back the it's talking. One person, one light. Absolutely. Hey, do you have your beautiful Miss Benson's Beetle to flash the cover at us? I do, I do. I have it right here. I'm going to have to disappear behind the Ooh. book. And also, if I do this, see, look, I've never had a book that shimmered before. That's amazing. Do you, do you have Pull of the Stars there? I do. Um, I don't think I shimmer. I, I've got slight relief, right? The lettering sticks up a little bit. Um, my Canadian cover um, is gold lettering. This one is yellow. Um, anytime I've, I've said to my publishers, oh, thank you so much for that cover detail, they usually nod darkly and tell me how much it cost. Like Virago once put a red ribbon bookmark into one of my novels and they told me it added a pound <laughs> to the cost. <laughs> okay, okay, yes. Well, I feel very lucky that I glimmer then. <laughs> anyway, um, we should have a bit of a substantial conversation, shouldn't we? Um, I just we finished should. Miss Benson's Beetle this morning and um, wow, what a ride. I kept thinking of, of, of uh, 
you know, echoes of things like Thelma and Louise, you know, not the typical, you know, tasteful, slow literary novel at all. This was a, no. a, an adventure on the high seas, literally. It is, it is, it's an adventure from start to finish. I set off to write an adventure and uh, it got more and more adventurous as I went. And the irony is, I don't know if it's the same for you, but sometimes I set out thinking, you know, this time I'm going to write a really quiet, introspective book. Uh, very, very, and that's what I thought about this one, that it would be, you know, it would, it would be very, very small. And it was just something about, and we must explain books a little, but for me, these two characters, when I put these two women together, it just sort of went, I mean, I'm quite an introverted, quiet person, but I think I, I developed an extrovert imagination for the, for the, you know, the duration of writing. Well, I do find it's a good sign when the book takes on a flavor or a style that we didn't bring to it to begin with. I mean, I do a huge amount of planning, so it's not really at the level of plot that my books would run away with me, but often the chemistry between two characters can surprise you, yes. Exactly. So with The Pull of the Stars, I mean, everybody's asking you this, I'm sure, but because it's about this pandemic uh, in 1918, um, did you, I mean, were you, well, first of all, what made you write about that in the first place? You know, of all dry sources, it was an article in The Economist magazine, which I was reading cover to cover because I was on a train without my laptop. I'd accidentally left my laptop at home. So I read Excellent. every yeah. every line of The Economist and there was an article on the 1918 pandemic. And I was so captured by the atmosphere of it. You know, the way it was a modern kind of city plague. It wasn't like medieval London or Shakespearean times. You know, this felt like our kind of world, you know, electrified and yet everything grinding to a halt when, yes. um, when the really bad peak of the, of the so-called Spanish flu hit in the autumn of 1918. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I wrote the whole thing in 2018, 2019, and it was going to be published next year. But then um, we realized everybody would be thoroughly sick of pandemic stories by then. So it wasn't so much that my publishers went, ha ha, I must publish it this year. It was more like, Oh, can't wait till 2021 or <laughs> people, people will never want now. to read about a virus again. So yeah, they got it out very I mean, fast. The resonances are extraordinary though. I loved it. I really loved it. And I, I have found it hard to read during this period. I, I'm, you know, I'm very open about that. But, but Pull of the Stars just, I, maybe because I recognised in some strange way, I recognised the landscape. I don't know, but I... I was really drawn into the story. I was drawn into the women. There were times I thought, well, actually our one is, you know, is, well, at least we're not kind of coughing up blood. And, uh, you know, <laughs> there was, but I thought the depth of it and the detail of it is, it's, it's extraordinary. Isn't it funny? I don't know if you get asked about the research, but we're often asked as if the research is some, you know, grinding task we have to get out of the way before we can write. And I personally love doing the research. There's nothing more pleasurable than immersing myself in specialist sources, like all your Beatle books in your list at the end. Yes. I was like, oh, I bet oh, that was fun. Yes. It was such fun. I mean, I think that's part of writing a novel, isn't it? That you accept that each one is going to be a journey. You know, I mean, for you, it's going to be a journey. And I probably wouldn't take it on unless it was going to be a journey, you know, unless I was going to learn something or just go somewhere in some way that I hadn't been before. But I was really interested in what, because actually before, before lockdown, I think I'd read Hamlet and I'd read Mark Haddon, The Porpoise. And, and, and it really struck me, I was, that you know, both have the plague. I was kind of wondering if in some way writers are, I don't know, I mean, it's not that you're foreseeing the future, but tapping into something in the consciousness. I found it really interesting to have those three books one after the other. I know, but I suspect there have been books published about people dying in plagues every few years. It's just we've never noticed, and then they you just know? Suddenly, yeah, yeah. And then just suddenly think, oh, oh yes. Yeah. Yes. And I think our novels have a rem remarkable amount in common because, okay, mine might be 1918 Dublin and yours is, is mostly 1950. Well, actually, I was going to say a location, but it, it stretches... It stretches from England all the way to New Caledonia, which I had to look up on Wikipedia, I must admit. Yes. So, well, so they're both, both, you know, far apart in setting, but they've both got remarkable echoes. We've both got sort of spinster heroines who are in many ways, you know, not taken seriously by the world. And female friendship is key to both of them. And, um, 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, even similarities we can't talk about because they're towards the end of the book. I know, it's such a shame that we can't talk about them, but we can't, I don't think, we, I, we can't. But also women who society might, even though um, Julia's only, it's her 30th birthday, isn't it? And Marjorie, for me, is 47. But for women who, who would have been seen by outsiders as probably, you know, that's it, that's your life. Your life it's not going to be any more change for you. They're both on the wrong that's, side of that line, aren't they? And so they yeah, both have to yeah. find meaning in what they do. So Julia Power is a nurse midwife and um, uh, your Miss Benson is a domestic science teacher with, you know, long suppressed dreams of adventure. And um, I, I, I thought they, they had a huge amount in common. They do, they do. And not least also the women that kind of, um, I'm going to say enlighten them, but I don't really mean that. I mean, the, the women with whom they find themselves are not pr probably the women they might have chosen. So Bridie, for, for Julia and Enid Pretty for Marjorie. I mean, Enid Pretty is the last woman that Marjorie would want to go on an expedition with. I love um, the way your Marjorie advertised for, for a helper, you know, an assistant who speaks French to go to New Caledonia with. And, you know, uh, Enid, she, her, her letter is so badly written that Marjorie doesn't even want to answer. She's scraping the barrel. She's the very, <laughs> very bottom of the heap. She is the, the last person she would want to go anywhere with. And also she's such an extrovert. And um, I, you know, I, in the same way that the bride is an extrovert, I would say. Yeah, I mean, my bride is Sweeney. I suppose I, I, I invented her as a nobody because I wanted Julia, who's running this tiny little maternity flu ward. Um, I wanted her to have some kind of helper, but I thought it would be fun if this was someone with no skills, no education, you know, nothing but goodwill and energy. So I came up with this young woman who... You know, she's a sort of product of the of the um, um, the orphanage and and sort of residential school system, and she's she has nothing to thank anyone for. She's she's really had a brutal upbringing, but she's got this sort of irrepressible spirit. So in both cases, I think, um, as you say, these are not friendships that would have been chosen. These are sort of very odd couple stories, aren't they? I kept thinking of, of film words for your book, not just because it's so cinematic, but like we have a word for the road movie, but we don't have any equivalent for the journey book. And you, you have written a few journey books. I mean, your Harold Fry was such a journey. I do love a journey, it has to be said. Although I think maybe next time I've got to not allow myself. I've got to take that away <laughs> from myself. I've got to say no more quests, no more journeys. I don't think your readers would agree. I mean, it's hard work <laughs> for you, right? You can't, you can't settle into a location. You know, if we've had no. one scene in, in the drawing room, <laughs> we're suddenly on to uh, landing in Brisbane, you know. Yes, um, yes. It's, I mean, yes, it's true. I mean, it's actually strange that because actually I'm quite a homey person. And actually, you know, in many ways, lockdown has suited me because I've had an excuse not to go anywhere. But I also knew that when I started writing, I wanted to write an adventure story for women. I was really clear in my mind that, you know, I read all the kind of classic male ones like Rogue Male and 39 Steps, all those. And I thought, right, I want this to happen. I want to give this to women. And I intended to have no men at all in the story. Um, and then, and then, I, and then I thought, well, it, it, maybe it will happen in France, this story, because I have a relationship with, with France. And I began to write it. And I just, every time they went to a boulangerie, I just thought, oh, no, I've seen it. I've read this. <laughs> this yes. is no adventure. We've all been to a lot of fictional boulangeries. We, we have, and they've been very nice too. We've had some lovely cakes, you know, and lovely like baguette. But I just thought this is no adventure for me. It's not a challenge for me. It's not a challenge for these women, not really to go to France. And it's not a challenge for the reader. And I, I really felt this had to be you know, an adventure for all of us, which is why I ended up on, in this island, New Caledonia, that I've, I've never been to. But... What I wanted to ask was about was about your res I mean, going back to your research when you when you when you were looking at 1918 and the pandemic and the hospital. Um, oh, do you is there a point where you go right? I've got all my research now, and now I just put it all. You know, it's all got to go away. Or are you still reading and re as, you, as you know researching as you're going? No, I, I I do most of it in advance, but I do a lot as I go along. Um, often trying to answer very specific questions, you know, ludicrously specific questions. Um, 
you know, I, I will have found out, say, you know, how they tested blood pressure in those days. Because a lot of my research was I would use modern medical websites to try and give me the most precise um, account of something like, you know, high blood pressure in pregnancy. And then I would kind of peel away the layers by trying to find out, do they have any of this knowledge, any of this equipment, any of these medical um, medications in 1918? And typically all those layers would peel away and I would find that, no, they just watched and waited. Um, so, uh, so the research was very much like that. But then I would have some question about exactly how did they test somebody's blood pressure with the, the bizarre bit of med equip medical equipment they had. And then I would say, were nurses allowed to do that? So I would, I would look up nursing manuals, which often have this weirdly sort of scolding tone, like nurses, you need to know this just so you'll understand what the doctor is doing, but don't try and do it because it's just ah. for the doctors. Nurses weren't allowed to use, to use a stethoscope even. So nurses would have their discreet little womanly ways of testing something like they would feel the pulse and they would try and, and guess your blood pressure just from the kind of rhythm of it. But that didn't have the kind of official knowledge of the doctor's reading of your blood pressure with his, with his machine. Um, so yeah, I used a lot of um, medical handbooks at the time and advice to nurses. Um, and um, there were still some things that I had great difficulty finding. For instance, I, pregnant women, women in late pregnancy, I know were very vulnerable to catching the flu, but I have not found any reference to hospitals actually having a sort of maternity slash flu ward, but they must have because you wouldn't put a woman in the middle of delivery in a flu ward and you wouldn't introduce flu into a labor ward. So it was just a sort of plausible concoction. And of course, I, you may go on journeys, Rachel, but I have this bad habit of shutting my characters in locked rooms. Or and I love it. I pretty, love it. Pretty confining not only that, ones. you do it all in three days. I thought you've made, you've not only found, you've found a ward and then there's, this is an overspill ward. So this is a, you know, a small room. You've not only done that, and then you've condensed, you put it all into three days. So it is like, you know, living and breathing every moment with Julia. Every, you know, ev everything she does. I thought I knew every square inch of that room. Every time, you know, some, and, and, and a mop, you know, a cloth that was tight. I knew where everything was. Yes, but I'm sure it can be a bit grueling to read, you know, whereas there's, there's a lot more breathing space in your book and a lot more of like oh now we're stepping off the ship and now we're you know, in a comfort displaced you know, persons <laughs> well what i think people should do is read the both of them together because they do have such parallels and i find it really interesting that we were both you know without knowing one another without speaking to one another we're both kind of approaching similar themes we're doing we're looking at vocation we're looking at motherhood um but and we're looking at friendship and what that means to women and how it can transform a life. But we're doing it in really, really different spaces. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a question. Oh, yeah, there's, there's pregnancy in both our books. And I was just going to say, isn't pregnancy a wonderful gift, narratively speaking, because it's kind of a ticking clock. Like in your book, there's a lot of um, ambiguity about exactly when the pregnant character is likely to give birth and does you know, has she lost the pregnancy or not? So it's a wonderful kind of tight thread through the narrative. Yes, I've never actually really written about pregnancy before. And again, I couldn't think why, because I've had four children, you know, it's the one <laughs> thing I, I really, really do know about this. And it, it is, a, I mean, I think to celebrate the things that women do is, is, a, is a marvelous opportunity. And I found it very liberating just to, you know, to have, to have that as my, if that was my, if that's the center of my stage. That's true. It, 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 it re-centers it, doesn't it? Because instead of just taking pregnancy and birth for granted, we actually, we put it in context where it's going to loom very dramatically large. You know, in my book, it's like, oh no, not in the middle of the pandemic, not a good time to be having babies. And, and also because in Ireland, the, the birth rate was so high and kept so high by the very sort of pronatalist culture of the Catholic Church. So again, that sort of defamiliarizes it because we're like, what do you mean she's on her 12th pregnancy? And in your book, yes. you literally put a pregnancy down in a sort of a jungle expedition context that, that makes us see exactly how dangerous and unpredictable it is. Well, I mean, both, both books, though, do, I mean, do, do kind of, yes, pay homage to how difficult it is and how, I mean, for both, for in both cases, it's life threatening. It absolutely is. And I, I find um, when we were expecting our first child 17 years ago, and um, one of the most useful books I came across was um, Naomi Wolf's book about 
I can't remember what it's called, but it's about birth. And she basically says, there's nothing sweet and pretty and be ribboned about this. You know, this is a, a loss. We are losing our freedom and we are bravely stepping forward into the next chapter of our life. You know, and she helped me see it in heroic terms rather than in kind of mumsy ones. So, so yeah, I think both our novels are trying to sort of make people notice that the major drama, which is that everyday event of a woman having a baby. Exactly, exactly. And for, I mean, for Marjorie, my character, she's quite, she's not snippy about it, but she hasn't had a very good relationship with her mother. I think it, you know, she doesn't really get what it's all about. And so, I mean, searching for a beetle is, is a, you know, is a, is a noble and a heroic thing, but actually witnessing a birth you know, it is for me, that is the kind of central moment of the book. That's when she really comes to life herself. Yeah, yeah. And I love that moment when, um, I think it's fair to say that there's a man who's been hovering nearby um, and, yeah. and um, when Marjorie steps out with the afterbirth, <laughs> he just sees her with, <laughs> with her arms full of blood and he flees. <laughs> so I thought that was a superb moment where, he's misreading the situation and he's like, what is this kind of monster, <laughs> you know, goddess of destruction moment? Yeah, yeah. But that, um, that man, that man it was not supposed to, I don't know what this has ever happened to you, but he wasn't supposed to be in the book. I mean, he really <laughs> was not supposed to be there. It was supposed to be the women. I knew that there was a father, but he, you know, he wouldn't be with the story for very long. But I don't know if you've ever had this. This I wrote this scene where this little chapter where he was interviewed for the job and he was not the right person for the job and that was it. He was supposed to go, and then every time I wrote this chapter with him in it, he just you know the detail would be too much. He just took took up too much book for somebody who was just going to walk on and walk off, and it was as if he just refused to accept that he was not central to this story. And in the end, I thought, well, come along then. I'll let you in. I'll let you in and let's see what you can do. I haven't had a character invade like that. But um, in this case, I, I was trying to use all fictional characters because I've, certain, I've sometimes written about real people and you feel a particular sense of kind of obligation to them. So this time around, I was intending for it to be a very real pandemic, but fictional people. But when I was researching doctors in 1918 in Ireland, suddenly I encounter Kathleen Lynn, who was this extraordinary figure. She was involved in the Sinn Féin revolutionary movement. She was their chief medical officer. She was a suffragist. She was a labor rights activist. Um, she was founding a new children's hospital. She lived with a woman all her life. Um, and she was an excellent doctor who no hospital would take on permanently. So in the first draft, I gave her a fictional name, you know, trying to slightly keep her at bay. And I didn't let her talk too much. You know, she was always just whipping busily through the ward. And then, really, I thought, this is, this is silly. She deserves a bit of fame. So I, I decided to let her have her name and to, to let her speak a bit more. Yeah. I'm really glad you did because she's, I mean, well, she's, that's the post-mortem scene, if I'm allowed to say that, is, is, is an extraordinary scene. But she also, I mean, what I, what I wondered about is when you, when you started, you, did you know it was her or then did you discover her in the writing of the book? That's what I mean, when you when you knew that you were going to have this doctor figure, was it her? I was going to be a sort of a version of her. I thought I would be freer to write if I wasn't constrained by facts uh, or, the, you know, she was obviously a contentious figure because she was on the revolutionary side. And I was trying to keep the politics out of it. But actually, my American agent said something very interesting to me. She said, since Trump, you can't keep the politics out of things. You can either write a book which has no relevance to modern politics, which is just a complete break from all that or you write a book in which people take a stand, but you said your readers are going to, you know, care about the politics even in 1918 Ireland. So I yeah. decided that really implicitly there was a lot of politics in there already because Julia's starting to realize that her patients are so ground down by poverty before they get the virus even. Um, yeah. She's starting to sort of see those connections between, you know, bad air, bad food, bad water, too many babies, you know, all the many things that keep communities vulnerable health-wise. And so, so in a way, she gave me permission to really start to tease out the politics a bit more. So um, it is fascinating how, you know, even if you're a major planner as I am, um, our books still deviate, don't they? <laughs> they still they do, take us on a ride. They do. Now, I just had a little notice then that we had five minutes left. I mean, ooh, I don't ooh. know that. Have I mean, we been gambling? Been more or less. Um, so I've set an alarm so that I, um, 
oh, I'm nervous of pressing my little button. Okay, we're going to sound like such um, technophobes. No, yeah, I'm nervous of pressing my little button to see what time it is. What time is it in England? This might help me out. Can you see well, the time 90, from where you are? It's, 90, it's five to eight. So I don't know whether we're, anyway, whether we're going to kind of just snap away or whether hmm. we're just you're talking. I just warning um, you that if... I was told it would be an hour and so we should keep the questions to the end. But in case we snap away, let's look at some questions now. Okay, so I'm scrolling past your face, Rachel, to see with some questions we got. Um, um, I'm skipping all the praise. It's awful how people praise us when <laughs> what we're asking for is hard-hitting questions. Um, uh, somebody's talking about my paint in my room. <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, somebody called Lamas1518 says, I've got 100 pages of a book, but I'm losing steam. Any tips? I know the ending, but it feels laborious to complete it without the excitement I had when I begun. What do you think, Rachel? Any tips for losing steam? Losing steam, I would say keep going. I would say keep going. Are we talking about writing or reading? Sorry. Yeah, no, she's got 100 pages of a book written, she or he. Oh, well, you must or keep they. going. Then, of course, 100 pages in, you will be losing steam. I mean, do you ever jump ahead? With oh, yeah, I, I, I do. Um, for, you know, if you, need, if you need a little jollying up, I certainly can let myself, you know, go, go write the fun scene. You know, I used to, when I began, I used to write all the, the scenes. When I say fun scene, by the way, I might include an execution, you know, or an autopsy, the scenes that are fun for me. Um, yeah. But I, let, I used to let myself write the juicy scenes and then kind of connect them. But then those bits were a bit laborious. So, so generally now I try and write them in order, but, but there are no rules, are there? So, so yes, you yeah. can certainly jump ahead to some scenes you find key. Um, yes. And it depends what I'm writing, of course. If I'm writing a screenplay, I often start to block it in backwards because you have to be so ruthlessly um, economical mm -hmm. with the screenplay. In a way, what you need is the last scene and then each scene that is a crucial stepping stone to get there and no others. But with a novel, I, yeah. thank God, yeah. it can all be a little more loose there. Um, I, I've, I've, in writing screenplays, I've found it very rewarding and satisfying and safe to do a lot at the end. I mean, just because you really know where you're heading and what's going to be important and what along the way isn't. And I actually find that with, I, I find that applies to novels as well, actually. And I certainly, I always know the ending before I begin. And I resent it when people um, imply that those of us who are planners, we somehow don't oh. get the fun, you know? <laughs> because of course, as we've talked about, there's all sorts of room for things to change as you're writing. It's just, if I know the ending, it gives me in momentum like an arrow, you know. Um, me too, me too. I mean, I, I sometimes think, well, I wouldn't go away without knowing where I was going. I mean, why, so why would I? And I feel the beginning and the end are absolutely, you know, they're, they're, there's the germ of one and the other. They are an answer or a question, but, you know, they are related. So I, I find I write the, begin, the beginning and the ending very early on. Though I once was at a literary festival um, with another writer who I really respected and I'm not going to name. <laughs> who, uh, in, the, in the questions, uh, somebody said to me, do you know, what, how do you write? And I explained that I write the beginning and I often write the end before I've got to the end. And uh, this writer was there. And uh, then I went to her talk and she was asked the same question. And she answered by saying, any writer Hmm. Rachel seems to be uh, mute for a little bit there. I've no idea what you're seeing at. Oh, well, I will just carry on talking. Rachel Joyce left. Or maybe, maybe Rachel can tap in again. Maybe they only let you in as a guest for half an hour. Who knows? Who knows? Okay, I'm going to tell you a bit more about Rachel's book while she's gone. Um, what did I want to say about it? Yeah, one of the really smart things about this book, I would say, is that you think that they're going to be a complete contrast, you know, because at first um, this, this, you know, brassy, brightly, brightly dyed hair, you know, uneducated, loud, extrovert, impulsive, speedy young woman, Edith Pretty, you think she's going to be just a complete contrast with the kind of, you know, grim, serious, spinsterish older teacher who's got enough money to go to... Um, to the ends of the world on this um, beetle hunting expedition. 
And then Rachel really smartly um, um, deconstructs this difference between them. So there's a moment, for instance, when Edith says to Enid says to her, you're no duchess, your clothes are just as shabby as me. And she realizes that actually they have quite a lot in common under the skin. And um, uh, also there are moments when each of them kind of falls apart and needs the other to be the strong one, needs the other to sort of, you know, get organized or in some cases in Enid's case, actually break the law. There's a lovely moment when she, um, when she says to, uh, to Miss Benson, you know, you didn't think we could do this trip by the book, did you? You know, there's no point sitting around waiting for all the right papers from the British consul um, because, um, you know, they're not going to let us do it by the book. So we actually have to break some rules. Um, so I'm just waiting to see. Is Rachel going to come back into this? Is even to oh, here we go. Here we go. Sorry. Yes, we will have Rachel back any minute now. Um, I'm just, here we go, add... Hi, Rachel. I don't know quite what happened there. I told you I, I got think a what happened. No, I think they only let people join for half an hour. I think this is some kind of two-tier system where, like, the boss of the meeting <laughs> has an hour and the visitors have half an hour. Who knows? Anyway. Well, I, I mean, probably, probably a very good plan. But um... <laughs> Anyway, I was just going on about the, um, the way the apparent total contrast between your two heroines gets wonderfully undercut. I love that moment when Edith says, you're no duchess. And I love those moments when each of them sort of falls apart or just has no more oomph to them and the other one kind of takes over. I thought it was superb that way. Um, wow. Again, it reminds me of something like Thelma and Louise. You know, it's not that one of them has all the drive. They just, they each have drive in different ways and at different times. They do. And also, I mean, and I think most importantly, and again, this is true, true of Julia and Bridie, I think they, they can't become the people they need to become without one another, but they don't realize that. As they, as they start off together. You know, they both have qualities. Enid needs more Marjorie and Marjorie needs more Enid. And it's the same, I think, for Julia and Bridie. And I mean, that's what's so beautiful about female friendship in all its complexities. And, and um, your Enid and Marjorie, they're both genuinely odd. So on the very first page of your book, you've got, you've got a child playing with, um, you know, shabby old wooden animals from a box and, you know, doesn't have the complete set. And there's a lovely line where it says, can she pair a three-legged legged camel and a bird with spots? And I thought, <laughs> oh, how lovely. Oh, how lovely. On the first page, we already have, you know, a question about the limits of a, of a, of a bond or a, a pairing up between, between not just opposites, but, you know, randomly contrasting people. So yes, I thought the whole thing had a beautiful shape. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think my favorite individual scene was when your Marjorie is failing to take a passport photo of herself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she thinks she could just get a passport without a picture and they force her to take one and she keeps bending down at the wrong time or getting interrupted. And also at the time, I thought that was just a little comic scene, a little set piece. You know, it was maybe the, the, the theater maker, the actor in you. But then it pays off so well because at various points in their um, elaborate international trip, the fact that the photograph has, has the head of a stranger popping their head yes. into the booth, that's hugely important to the plot. So that was just it's, superb. It's so important, but I would like it. I mean, again, it wasn't entirely planned that way. The, the things happen and then you think, oh, I see. Yes, yes, I see that we can use this. This is useful. So I didn't know that the, a woman was going to pop into the back of the booth and destroy the photograph, you know, but it just becomes, and that's what's delightful, I think, about writing fiction is that not everything goes according to plan. What I love about novels, because, you know, now having a bit of experience of screenplay writing, I realize how, what, a, what a wonderfully long leash we're on when we write novels. You know, nobody's going to tell us, like in the days of the Brontes, the novel has to be a set length. Nobody's, you know, for adult fiction, there are really no rules. Whereas I found when I've written for children, there are still a few rules. So, um, yeah, I love the fact that a scene could afford to be <clears throat> just a bit of enjoyable comedy. Um, it may pay off and all the better if it does, but it doesn't have to. Whereas in a screenplay, every scene has to earn its way in and has to be worth yes. spending the money on. <laughs> Yes, yes. And where does it lead to? And how is, how is my character different? The end of the scene from the way they were at the beginning, even if it's only <laughs> six lines long. Yes, everything has to have an arc. <laughs> no. It does, yes. it does, even the smallest things. So are you, I mean, do you want to go to more questions? I'm terrified I'm going to be cut again. But No, I, 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 I think you probably get half an hour at a time. 
Um, oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'll relax oh, look at this. Rachel Masklips says, are you aware, Emma, that your book could be a very effective birth control? <laughs> well, I wouldn't mind that really in that I'm sort of writing <laughs> against that Irish tradition of, you know, women as baby making machines. I mean, I'm aware that in The Pull of the Stars, there are moments that are quite Handmaid's Tale. Um, for instance, I was trying to find out at one point um, what they would do if, if a baby was sort of stuck, you know, and I thought, oh, did they do cesareans? And I looked it up and to my horror, I found that in Ireland, they tended to do these two operations, um, symphysiotomy, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and pubiotomy, where they would basically snip the pelvis to let it go wider. Oh, because I mean, when, when one was about to happen, I think that was the only moment where I kind of read, I mean, I sort of read a bit, I think I did. <laughs> Oh, have I got to see that? And I was so yeah. relieved the way that things worked out. Yes, so that's relieved. right. But, I, I thought I wanted to raise it as a possibility because this was standard yeah. practice in Irish hospitals because it allowed the woman to keep having babies. You can't do multiple, multiple cesareans, but this operation they could use to, you know, to ensure that the baby making machine kept working at full force. Um, so, um, yeah, I didn't want it to actually happen, but I needed to raise it as a possibility. Um, so, yes, I realized there are. You know, there are, committing a novel um, to to realistic representation of of birth um, is is going to be at times quite grueling for the readers. Yes, um, yes. There's, there's no escapism in this one. Oh, here's a question for you, Rachel. Do you see the story in your mind as it unfolds? Asks Patrice seven six one seven. Do I see it in my mind? Yeah, yes, do I, would... I do see it in my mind. I mean. I, I have never been to New Caledonia and I knew I wasn't going to be able to go to New Caledonia where the story is set and I had to do a lot of research about New Caledonia but interestingly there are no novels set there so I couldn't, I couldn't wow. find any fiction um, but what I did find were some extraordinary pamphlets um, over the years, you know, travel guides and then, I mean, you can't even do Google Maps in New Caledonia. You don't really? get really. So it was, it was really fascinating to piece together what this island might look like from lots of different accounts, and then to be really brave and just to say, okay, so I think this, you know, this correlates, and from what I'm seeing, this works. But now this is fiction, and I've got to make this work. I'm not writing a travel guide. Um, I need to make this now work with the story. Well, I, I, it doesn't surprise me that you didn't go because I hate it when journalists assume that the only way we can access the truth about a place is to get on a bus or a plane and go there. Because if I'm trying to visit the past, the past is not there anymore. So um, when I set a novel in the Welsh borders in, in the mid 18th century, I thought, I don't want to be distracted by the Starbucks at, at the bus station, you know. So I did all the research on the first draft first and then I went there, but I tried to just look at the landscape. Because really, you know, your new Caledonia in, in, um, in, in 1950 won't be there. Yeah. No, it won't be there. It won't be. Somebody's asking if I can finish the story about the, um, the writer. Oh, the, yes, yes. The, so, so, the, yeah, so you went I to the writer's session. I hope that wasn't sent from above. That, that's, I've been cut off <laughs> being telling a story about it. But anyway, this writer said in front of all these people and asked the question, anybody who tells you that they write the beginning of the book and then the end is the most dull writer I can imagine. And I was, I was mortified. I was so ashamed. But I do still do it. You know, um, um, the, the distinction between planners and pantsers, you know, I, I think the pantsers often say rude things about us at literary festivals <laughs> because... They get to sound so much cooler, you know, sometimes um, they'll, you know, the late, great Timothy Finley, um, I remember him saying, you know, the muse just inspires me and the book comes down through my head, down my arm to the end of my hand. So that just sounds way better. You're like, you know, Byron or, um, you know, somebody on LSD in the 60s. You just sound way cooler than us drudges. <laughs> but, you know, know, how would they like it if we went to literary festivals and we stood up and
Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, I may have caused that um, this time. I was carefully setting alarms so we would know to answer some questions, but maybe that intervened. As you can tell, I'm learning on the job here. Um, I'm hoping Rachel will come on again. Uh, but yeah, how would, the, uh, how would the panthers like it if, if we planners stood up at literary festivals and said, if you don't know your ending before you began, it's going to be a baggy and shapeless book. You know? <laughs> but no, it is much better that we not insult each other because after all, it doesn't really matter how you write a book so long as it works for you. There are no rules at all. Um, I see there. Let's see. Here we go. Oh, look, Art Sniffer. Am I saying it right? Art Schiffer, Art Sniffer, um, says uh, that they would choose planners over pantsers any day. <laughs> Here we go. Rachel again. You know, it does give it a, an extra excitement that Rachel keeps dropping out of view, you know. It's like she's the star turn who comes on and off. Hello again. <laughs> you know, I, I suspect I've... that one could have been my alarm. I'd set an alarm so that we'd remember to look at the questions. But <laughs> suddenly it was saying, Rachel Joyce, leaving, leaving. Anyway, thanks for your persistence. Yes. Well, no, was... actually what I do is I run it. Fortunately, I have all, all my grown-up children are back home again. So I just run oh. out into the house going, help, help, help. Oh, that's superb. Um, Mine, you would think mine would be useful to me because they're 13 and 17, but they're so busy with their own online lives, you know. Um, um, oh, look, Gentle Mummy 1971 says, as a midwife, very much looking forward to your book. You know, I hired a midwife to help me out because a lot about midwifery is not written down anywhere. Um, you know, so, so I could find books that would tell you how to be a nurse in 1918, and they would even have a chapter on obstetrics, but that's different from the tradition of midwifery. So in my first birth, for instance, um, I found that, you know, the midwife and the doula, who's a birth sort of helper, um, they taught Chris how to press on my hips and suddenly the pain was cut in two. And, you know, when I was writing this novel, I went looking for, you know, when did they first invent this kind of counter pressure? And I really couldn't find a written history of it at all. So I suspect there's a kind of an oral history of ways women have helped with birth stretching yes. since the dawn of time. So, um, yeah, I wanted a midwife to, to vet my book and she was rather horrified by all the ways that they worked in 1918 um, <laughs> yes and then I was really lucky I also had a copy editor who is an emergency room doctor at the same time and she was literally uh, you know working with people during COVID in March and April and then half the time she'd be helping me with my book so that was hugely helpful so you don't want to get it wrong if you're writing about medicine you know you really really don't no you don't and also you owe to midwives to get it right you so do. And, and to get that sort of balance between, you know, the, the official training and the official rules and then the more um, instinctive stuff. And um, for instance, I found there were moments in my book where if I went by the official policy, my characters would seem very hard hearted. So there's a stillbirth, for instance. And, um, you know, I know the protocol. I know that Julia was meant to put the stillbirth in a box, put it on a high shelf and never refer to it again. Distract the mother from it you know, just talk about other things. And that seemed absolutely yeah. brutal. So of course, yeah. you know, I, I'm free to imagine that she would in fact have bent the rules a bit. She wouldn't have suddenly been talking in very modern, you know, feel your feelings ways, but I'm sure there were ways to express sympathy um, and to leave at least some room for, for talking about it, you know, even if the rules didn't approve that, you know? Yes, yes. But also in choosing your overflow small room, it's as if you've created a space where the rules can be slightly, you know, subverted or changed. And I think that's one, again, one of the really interesting things about the book is we know that there's another ward where, you know, where things are going on, but this is like this tiny little space with, I mean, it is three beds, isn't it? Though yeah, three one, beds, three beds. Three beds, especially for three days. Um, so yeah, we get, yeah, we do get a very intense relationship with those women. Sorry, I've been distracted by questions at the beginning. No, no, that's fine. Um, uh, Possum Book says, can we hear more about Rachel's books? So, um, oh. Oh, yeah, well, one thing I have to say is that um, uh, when I was writing my last novel, which is about a 79-year-old, um, your unlikely pilgrimage of Harold Fry was one that I went back to immediately because it's rare for older characters to be taken very seriously in fiction, isn't it? I mean, we've, we've all read yes. so many books about 20-year-olds and so few about 80-year-olds. Yes, yes. Although it wasn't something I consciously thought about when I was writing the book. You know, you kind of 
sometimes I think, you know, you were saying, you were mentioning earlier kind of extraordinary quirky moments. And I think the thing is about, for each of us when we're writing, our, story, our characters and the stories don't seem quirky or odd. We kind of really see how they work. So it didn't seem strange to me at all that this man would suddenly decide to, to walk the length of England. It, 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 it had a logic in my heart or brain or wherever it was. Um, yes, that kind of, that, that, that made the whole thing seem quite plausible. And then I'd also been lucky in that with Harold Fry, he'd started as an afternoon radio play on BBC Four. Really? Yes, yes. And I'd written it for three actors. I'd written it for Anton, Rogers and um, Anna Massey and my friend Nee Cusack who played everybody else and she just played everybody but so I had a very clear picture in my head when I was writing the book of Anton who was one of those actors he had a marvelous I mean he had there were so many Haroldy things about him but he was a gentleman you know he, he had that he could be hilariously funny he had a bit where he was pressing a doorbell it's not even that funny, but I was, I was in stitches, you know, way after everybody else had stopped laughing. I just couldn't control myself. That kind of, that mix between ordinary and very funny and then moments of extreme tenderness where you felt you saw right into his heart. So it was a bit of a gift to have had that before I wrote the novel. That process sounds wonderful because... You know, I know when I write a play, the first time there's a table read, I'm starting to cut already. There's so many lines that I realize I don't need because the actor has evoked and implied enough with the previous lines. And so when I'm writing a novel, I rather feel the lack of a bunch of actors helping me out in this way. <laughs> you know, maybe I should hire an actor or a group <laughs> of actors to read through my first drafts and, you know, all the, all the unnecessary lines would fade away. So that sounds absolutely wonderful that you got to kind of um, well, see it played it was, out to start with. Yes, it was. It was a lovely way in. I mean, it hasn't happened since. But do you, when you're writing, do you read aloud your... Um... I do. I do. The first draft, yeah. And, and with this book, I really wanted a very sort of terse style. Somehow it felt so pared down, literally, you know, so many shops shut, so many staff off sick, so many people dead. It felt like, you know, loose words cost lives, you know. So I, I did a lot of going through each sentence and seeing what words could I do without. And then, for instance, um, quotation marks fell away. I've never written a book with no quotation marks before, because even though it's a legitimate style, which has been around since uh, James Joyce, it, it irritates some readers excessively. Yes. Um, yes. And um, so I've never done that before, but I just had this feeling that for this book, I didn't want any quotation marks. I wanted the whole thing to have a very... Um, almost trippy feel, like the, you, there's no distinction between the words spoken and the thoughts going through Julia's head. So I think yeah. it's really important to, to follow your instincts on these things, on these decisions, even if it might potentially annoy readers. Speaking of annoying people, there's a very specific question about one of your books that I mustn't forget to put to you. Speaking of research and your wonderful yeah. book, The Music Shop, says Amina 5361, can you please tell us what's the significance of 12 tonar Reykjavik? Oh, what do you think? well, this was, yes. I mean, the, the joy of writing the music shop was that a lot of the music that research, I mean, there was all the music research, which was, you know, it was a great journey to go on, but also had a brilliant excuse to visit record shops everywhere I went. And you know, it was necessary that I found them and went in. And anyway, one in Reykjavik is called 12 Tonar. And uh, it was just my perfect my perfect record shop. They, I mean, it, was, it wasn't like the music shop that I wrote about because it was much cleaner <laughs> and more, and more civilised. But you felt you could go in and there were, great, there were kind of great cities where people could just sit and listen to music and you felt people had maybe been there for days and nobody would really mind or throw <laughs> them out. You could just keep listening. And for such a small shop, we came away with such a kind of diverse selection of music. So it was one of those shops that you just feel is a bit special. Um, it is nice when the research process for a book doesn't involve, you know, 1910s medical manuals. Honestly, some of those pictures just make me gag. Um, but instead, when it involves something pleasurable like, radio, like record shops. So, so with, um, with Akin, my last novel, um, I had to go into a lot of boulangerie because it was set in Nice, you know, and there were quite a few <laughs> scenes involving pastries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, in fact... And, and the whole family were with me, my partner and, and, and kids, we were all in Nice for a year and I knew I would be writing the novel. So 
as I, as I lived through that year, I just took notes on everything that happened. And in particular, if the kids were acting up in a restaurant or were having some ridiculous squabble about whether the beef burger was bleeding, I would think, well, at least I'll use this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, Cricket Drew is asking you, any plans for Harold Fry to make it to the small or big screen? Oh, well, yes, that's what I'm, that's my lockdown project. Yes, I've been working oh. on the day of Harold Fry. Yep. Oh, how exciting. Yes, it is. It's really exciting. And it's lovely to revisit him. Um, you know, he's a very old friend. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good place to go. But as you say, there's so much pairing back to be done. And so much of the book, actually, is memory. And um, flashback is a slightly... I mean, I think in books, flashbacks are marvellous. But in films, they can be quite heavy going. I think you have to use them very, very sparingly. No, you're right, because when it happens in a book, it's pretty effortless. Like I noticed, you know, your book is basically 1950, but, but quite yeah. often jumps back to, um, in particular, to Marjorie's childhood or to when she was about yes. 20. And maybe the difference is that that's what we're seeing is what's going through her mind. Whereas in film, it's like, here's the literal thing that happened. Um, it's, yes. it's more committed to realism. So it's more of a lurch. No, it is, it is. It is. I think it's I mean, I think it can be done. Everything can be done. And it's exciting. You know, that, that's a great challenge. To, you know, how can I use this medium to best tell this story? But that is definitely my challenge with Harold Fry is how do we really get inside Harold's heart? Because if we're not really with Harold on the journey, it's just a bit of a jolly walk, you know, up the UK. Yeah, and, I know um, what you mean. With sprightly music in the background. Yeah, um, I'm yeah. not, I Okay, just to generalize Wellesley, I find no novels are great at doing psychology. And it's much harder to show those thoughts on the screen. Uh, here's an example. Um, the Armistead Mopan novel, The Night Listener. Um, this writer gets all these calls from this teenage, teenager. And at one point he starts to worry, is he being hugged? Is the teenager not a teenager at all? And then the book that's kept wonderfully ambiguous because all we know is that voice. Whereas in the film, they have to literally, you know, go there and show us who's talking to him. And it it, 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 you know, it, it removes the ambiguity. So I yeah. suppose, yeah, that's why a, a film flashback is so different. And um, I'm really glad you're doing it yourself, though, Rachel, because I think um, there's been a really heartening shift in this. It used to be thought that the novelist was the last person who should be allowed to adapt their work for the screen. You know, there was this idea that, you know, only for the film people really know how. And of course, most, most screenwriters yeah. have been men. It's been a male-dominated job exactly. far longer than novelist has. So whenever yeah. I meet a young woman who's just you know, um, um, had a bestseller and is, you know, she's, she'll say, oh, there's talk of a film. I, I just sort of get her by the throat and say, do it yourself. It's not rocket science. <laughs> no, it's not. And uh, I mean, I think like you, me, you probably like the, the challenge of different ways of telling a story. I mean, I, you know, I find it really liberating. And I, yeah, I find that the more I learn about other ways of telling stories, the more I can bring that back to the novel, which is, um, you know, it, it's exciting. So, yeah, good, I'm really glad I'm going to have this screenplay. Yeah. And also, it's often assumed that we'll be so sort of besottedly attached to our characters, we won't want to change a line. And really, like, if you, if you love Harold Fry, you're going to want him to be the best film character there is. And that may need different words. It, yes, or maybe he's got to go, you know, it's different things have got to happen. I absolutely agree. I think people do think that you will be, that one of the reasons writers shouldn't, de you know, develop their own, their own books is that they won't let go of decisions that they've made. But I love letting go of decisions I've made. You know, those people may not realise how many things we let go of in, in, in the drafting process yeah. of our novels, you know. Um, yes. We may seem like we're absolutely attached to everything and they don't realise <laughs> You know, the, the number of things we've thrown away or improvised at the last minute. Oh, here's an interesting question from Alison is reading. How important are titles to you? And at what stage of the process is your title finalized? So Rachel first. Titles are so important. They're like, I mean, they're as important as the jacket. I think the jacket is, is, is the door into the, you know, into the story. And, it's, and it tells you, you know, it entices you in. It gives you a flavor of what the book is. But the title, the titles are so difficult, aren't they? I mean, I know Miss Benson's Beetle may not seem that complicated as a title. You wouldn't believe how many places I went trying to get there. And I knew the one thing I did not want was the dirty, 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 dirty of Marjorie Benson. 
Yeah, I yeah. really, really, really didn't want that. In fact, I wasn't sure that I wanted it with Harold Fry in the first place. I thought I wanted a very short title for Harold Fry and ended up with this great, you know, which I loved. Um, but uh, Miss Benson's Beetle, I, in the end, I thought it's just got to say what it is. But how about and also, you? I mean, the first stars. But it, it's, a li it's alliteration as well. You see, it's not like exactly. Miss Jones's Tomato, you know, um, it's, no. it's somehow... No. It, it's got the right ring to it, you know. And the beetle is this hugely important symbol. Um, uh, you know, the, I, I know there's a kind of a double quest through the novel, but then the very idea of sort of, you know, your question, how, how committed should you be to the thing that you set out looking for and how much should you allow yourself to deviate from that or to give up on it or to rethink it? Yeah. So I thought, no, I, th I think it's just the right title. And um, I think of myself as really good at titles and a lot of my titles have, you know, never been questioned at all. So... The Pull mm -hmm. of the Stars, I found pretty early when I was, you know, the way we yeah. look up the meaning of every word. So influenza, I looked up and I found that it meant influence, the influence of the stars. Um, so 14th century Italians thought that the stars were kind of tugging on us and that's what made us ill. So I thought that yeah. was a wonderful image for kind of being mysteriously interfered with by fate, you know. Um, yes. But I wanted to put it in a more concrete way. So instead of influence, um, I went for pull. Um, and I was probably slightly echoing, there's a famous Irish play called The Plough and the Stars, yeah. again, set in those Dublin slums. But, you know, and other, other titles of mine, like, say, Room, nobody's ever questioned or rethought. But about every third novel, mm -hmm. I have to say, my publishers don't like my title, and sometimes they are entirely right. So, yes, well, um, yeah, yeah my, my, I have a, my first historical novel way back in 2000 was called Slammerkin. Um, but all the time I was writing it, it was called The Complaint of the Crows, which I think nobody would have bought. It sounds so dreary, you know. <laughs> and I remember Lenny Goodings at Virago, she sat me down and said, OK, that title has to go. And she said, let's have a, something about clothes because your main character is a seamstress, some lovely word about 18th century dresses. So we literally went through my vocabulary list that I had on file. Yes. And there was this word slammerkin, which means a loose dress. And she was like, well, ooh, that sounds good. And I was like, Lenny, you're mad. Nobody knows what the word means. It's so obscure. And she says, it doesn't matter. Sounds good. You know? And it turned out to mean a loose woman as well. So she was, she was spot on. So yeah, every now and then, there'll be a long protracted discussion with publishers. With The Wonder, for instance, we went back and forward. I had called it Mana originally. And my publisher said they asked all the younger people working for them who said they'd never heard of Mana. You know? So you think something is a shared cultural <laughs> reference. Yes. And then you find yes. maybe not. Maybe it's only for the 50-year-olds, yeah. you know? So, so I have learned yes. to take advice on titles. Yeah, I, well, I, yes, why, why wouldn't we? I mean, I do remember the love song of Miss Queenie Hennessy absolutely came with the idea. So sometimes they do just come packaged, don't they? Yeah, and in that case, I suppose it's sort of a companion book to Harold Fry, isn't it? So having a similarly structured title yes, is graceful, yes. you know. Yes, it, it was, but it was just there. And that is, that is always a, oh, there's another question coming up here. Oh, so Ivy Valentina says, do you ever imagine real actors playing your characters in your head while writing? Oh, I wonder, does she mean particular actors? I mean, you've got a lot of actor friends, so you could, you could populate your imagination with very real <laughs> actors. Yes, I mean, do you? I do sometimes do that. Yes, I mean, I, or I actually recently it's been photographs more than anything. Wow. Than you mean you yeah. see them with the face of a real person from a photograph? Yes, I mean, not, they're not actors. I don't mean actors. I mean, actually, uh, for certainly Marjorie and Enid, I found a photograph, I mean, a little way into writing the book of two women, May Morris and Mary Lobb, uh, who... Do you, you know? And yes, I do. I do. Uh, yes. I mean, something about the way those two women stand together in this photograph, I found so moving. And I really recommend, you know, going and finding the photograph, just seeing one woman facing the camera full and then the other standing at an angle. And the way that standing together like that enabled them to be the women that they seem to be. I found that really moving. You know, there's a photograph of Kathleen Lynn, the doctor from my novel, and the woman she spent her whole life with, Madeleine French Mullen. And again, one is head on to the camera and one is to one side. That's very interesting. Yeah. And yeah. the 1918 flu was really the first plague to be documented in photographs. So I used a lot of photographs. And sometimes uh -huh. I put individual photos into the novel, like in the first chapter, Julia's looking out the window of her tram and she sees this couple go by, not just in masks, but kind of beak-like. 
pointy. They looked like bird masks. So I thought, ooh, that actual image I need to put straight into the book, you know? Isn't it fantastic? I love it when you find an image and you think, and it's, and you know it's real and you know you can have it. Yeah, it just gives you a it's shiver. Like really landing on the ground as, you, as, you, as you're writing. And then you know that you can kind of jump again. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly, I've been inspired by, say, paintings uh, pre-19th century, but paintings are more sort of carefully studied. Photographs have this way of just capturing the happenstance. Um, I did one novel set in the 1870s called Frog Music, and again, the photographs were superb because a lot of San Francisco, you know, burned down or was, was knocked down in the uh, earthquake and fire. So um, a lot of the, the physical landscape of San Francisco isn't there anymore, but the photographs would capture, say, Chinatown or, um, you know, sort of swaggering women in pants um, in a way that I don't know any other way we could ac access them so well. Oh, here's a good question. Katrina yeah. Beaupre says, do you think 42 is too old for me to start to write properly? I have plenty of ideas and plans, but no confidence. 42 too late. You know, they're mistaking us for gymnasts. They don't realize we can... I think Mary Wesley started in her 70s. Yes. Because also, Penelope by the time you start Gerald to write a book... In 70s, didn't oh, yeah? Who did? Penelope Fitzgerald. Really? Oh, my I'm God. Sure, yeah, yeah. Because here's the yeah, thing. By the time you start writing a novel, you are really drawing on a lifetime's use of words. You've been reading, you've been speaking, you've been emailing, you've been writing. You've been watching. Yeah. Yeah, you've been living. <laughs> And in a way, you have all the more experience built up. Whereas I have to say, if you're someone who's never had any other job like me, your own personal experience doesn't get you very far. So every now and then in a book, I'll use a bit of my experience, like, you know, having babies, or I did one novel called Landing about moving to Canada. Um, but, you know, mostly I have to use history and, or, or make it all up or, or borrow storylines from my friends because all I've been doing is staying home and writing, you know, my life's been like a perpetual COVID lockdown. So it does not give me much to write about. So I do, I do envy people who've, you know, been out there building up one of those classic writer's CVs of, you know, ranch hand, chambermaid, bit of this, bit of that. But have you been writing? I mean, in what, letting one go, does another novel kind of step into place? Oh, it's usually in place already, like they overlap. Yeah, I think I started The Pull of the Stars um, when I'd sold my last novel and I was taking a little break before doing rewrites. Um, yeah, so they almost always overlap for me. I'm, I'm besieged by ideas. I feel quite stressed by them sometimes. You know, on the, on the left of my computer screen, I have books I've just printed and then there are ones in the middle that I'm working on and then over on the right are the future projects and they come at me like mosquitoes, you know? Yeah. I can I'm not complaining, complain. really. Yeah. No, I'm not either. I think but we're both very lucky that we have so many ideas. Um, but I have the same thing. I, I have kind of boxes on my computer so, you know, where, where, the, where, they, you know, where they might be. And I also find when I finished one, I feel that a number are coming in to kind of size me up and work out whether or not, you know, we're just kind of working out whether we're right for one another. So that even if I begin to write something, I'm not always completely committing to it. And sometimes I feel the book isn't completely committing to me either. You know, we're... We're kind of Ooh. dancing around one another a little. Oh, that's interesting because I feel that mine are each hassling me, each wanting me to write them next. Yours sound more discerning or maybe more like speed dating or something. They're not too sure about you, whereas mine seem very needy. Mine are sort of <laughs> queuing up with a ration book saying, oh, I want the sausage. <laughs> I, did, I did have to write a book of short stories because I had a lot of cut characters that, you know, had ah. been in books. And um, I felt they, I, I work in a kind of small caravan in, a, in the middle of the field, which is amazing. But I felt it was being crowded out with all these cut characters who just had, you know, wouldn't leave me alone and needed some kind of voice. So I did feel they, I, they each had to have a short story and then they might go away. And fortunately they did. Oh, that's a lovely genesis for a book of short stories. And um, I've always found short stories harder to publish in that I've, I've come up with collections every now and then my publishers have always groaned and flinched you know so I've only managed to sell them by you know giving them to a publisher who had an option on my book and then saying the next will be a novel I promise <laughs> well I, th I, th I think there is that about short stories but I don't really understand why because actually we like stories told very you know quickly don't we I mean you know and there's kind of you know people are now like tv episodes that last you know half an hour that that's the kind of concentration so it seems to me actually that 
short stories should be enjoying a bit of a revival. You know, they should be. And in some countries, you know, in Ireland, they've always been taken very seriously and you get yes. great new short story writers like, say, Kevin Power. And um, Canada takes its short stories pretty seriously, too, with people like Alice Munro. But um, I think the general readership has been rather lost. I think, yeah. I suspect people want to escape into our books, you know, even if they're sometimes about about gross or horrifying things, they want to immerse themselves. And a short yes. story, there is that moment at the end when you're slightly jerked out of it. You have to change trains. But, um, but yeah, I, I love, most writers love yeah. reading short stories. Um, yeah. But they are perhaps just necessarily a little more literary because they remind you that you are reading rather than that you immerse. I yeah. see uh, Patri7617 says, Rachel, do you have a favorite author? Um, well, we've mentioned Penelope Fitzgerald. She is, I mean, she is one of my, I, I think, I, I mean, I reread and reread and reread her. I mean, Alice Munro, too, you've mentioned. Uh, I think an extraordinary, extraordinary writer. Um, I, I always find on. these questions rather agonizing, aren't they? It's like being asked live on Instagram, who's your best friend? No, really, yes. really, you're yeah. super best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, but if you had to name two, as I've just done two. Oh, I'm a huge fan of Sarah Waters. And yes, I'm a huge so fan good. of Roddy Doyle. I think I have uh, yeah. all their books. And I just found I'm doing an event with Roddy. What fun. Um, wow. You know, I think, I think this should become the fashion, Rachel, doing, um, you know, joint events from different continents. Because first of all, it's very sophisticated and cosmopolitan, is it not? <laughs> and... <laughs> But also, it's, so it's less positive. lonely. You know, we're yes. not just individually yes. bleating away on, on a live uh, social media platform for an hour wondering, is anyone listening? I think it's lovely having someone to talk to. It's, it's really, really lovely. Yes, I'm really enjoying it. Apart from the, the kind of just the technology. I mean, I've seen a couple <laughs> where, I mean, I saw one yesterday where somebody got their, their mobile phone at an angle, so they appeared to be lying down for most of it. And then, you know, there have been <laughs> others where, you know, people become pixelated. I think, you know, we maybe just got to understand, because we're going to be, we're thrown right into it, aren't we? We haven't had any practice runs. Yeah, you and I yeah. couldn't practice doing an Instagram live before we met one another. So no, indeed. And I was convinced the button wouldn't work. And my main fear was that I wouldn't manage to, <clears throat> to see your message asking for entry. And I would effectively shut you out. So I would be like, <laughs> as if someone was doing a bookshop reading and wedging the door shut behind them. And I knew I would have had to speak eloquently about Miss Benson's Beetle for the entire hour to make up for it. You know? <laughs> so I'm so glad we've achieved this. Bad thing. I mean, I know you've dropped out of it three times, but you see, I think this makes you the star figure because you're like Cher oh, coming onto the stage and then she goes off to change her costume and her backup dancers do a little dance to just, you know, yeah. keep the audience occupied. But everyone's just waiting for Cher to come back. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that you've compared me to Cher and I will not <laughs> wish for that. And you're a lot younger, obviously. I was just <laughs> going for a, a, a parallel in terms of fame well, and glory, you know. Glory, you know? <laughs> Um, I think we should probably wind up because this way we'll be in charge of our own ending rather than, you know, exactly. cutting out exactly. in, in mid-syllable. And exactly. yes. um, thanks very much for all the questions, everybody. Um, lots of nice comments coming up. Um, so Rachel's, Rachel's book is Miss Benson's Beetle and mine is The Pull of the Stars. Thank you so much to Waterstones for letting us take over thank their, you, um, their platform. Yes, thank you for giving us this. And um, above all, everybody, keep buying books you know, and um, maybe from your local independent bookshop, just a suggestion. Yes. Yes. Um, and just have to say, I went to my local Waterstones the other, on, uh, the, the other day, and it was such a relief to get into my oh. water, local Waterstones. And I thought, oh, is it going to be, will I feel a bit funny about this? We had the most brilliant chat about books, you know, all the books I'd missed. Oh. I could go around, I could look at them all. It was, su it was just such a good time to get, you know, getting back into yeah. Waterstones. Again. Yeah, and I know I would not have got through pandemic without books. Luckily, I was just about to plunge into Hilary Mantel's um, the, the Mirror and the Light, the third of her Thomas Cromwell oh, okay. books, when yes. pandemic broke out. So I was just like, okay, I'm not going to worry about the end of the world. I'm just going to plunge in and, and make this last as long as I can. <laughs> well, this has been a treat. Thank you so much, Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. thank you, Emma. I really, really enjoyed meeting and you, let's, even do, on my mobile phone. And let's do this again next time and I will work out yes. how not to drop you repeatedly from the frame. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it shows it's very real and spontaneous, doesn't it? You know, it does. It does. <laughs> it's all very live. Okay, I'm going to right, uh, say bye-bye to everybody now. Thank you all bye -bye so much.
I'm Spicy. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 And let me see. <laughs> Can I find, oh, there's an end button. Okay, thanks so much, everybody. Um, and my daughter did my nails for my first Instagram appearance, by the way. Bye-bye. Trying to end this and put it on IGTV. Sorry, Jen, anyone who's still with me. I'm just working out how to put this on IGTV. Like many authors, I wish that we'd been trained for all this.